Are you struggling to reinvent yourself? Do you find yourself running into the same old life circumstances to the point where you just feel stuck? Well, it's okay to be stuck from time to time. Times of being stuck are the best opportunities to figure out an effective way out. This brings me to identity shifting, one of the most powerful approaches to truly reinventing yourself and changing your life. Today we explore my unique methodology for identity shifting, and by the end of this video, you'll have a clear roadmap for unhooking yourself from the perpetual quicksand you may be feeling in your life. Let's get into it. This video is going to be S tier, all breaking down identity and how it works and how to truly shift your identity to become a newer, better person. I'm sure you hear this phrase all the time, identity shifting. And there's a reason why you hear about it. It's because it's a very fundamentally powerful way to change your life because our lives are a reflection of who we are at our core. Because how we think, how we behave, what's in our subconscious mind all have a correlation with what reality brings to us and how we behave in the world. So it's an important fundamental root thing to solve rather than looking for motivation, looking for life hacks, looking for 30 day challenges, all this stuff is a waste of time. Core thing you want to focus on is who you are, who your ego is, because identity equals ego. I have a pretty unique approach that I want to share with you in this video. And some of the things in this video, I don't really hear talked about that much. Um, you also get a pretty good behind the curtain understanding of some of the things that are in my identity resonance program. For those of you who haven't joined and for those of you who have completed the program, uh, this video will be a great um, review for you guys. Now, let's define identity. Quote, identity, identity is the qualities, beliefs that make a particular person or group different from others. Now, identity shifting is ego development. You're shifting from person A to person B because you deem that person B is more in, in line with the life that you want and the circumstances you want to experience. Or you feel like the qualities of person B are of higher quality, are of more integrity and such. You feel better be being this person than the current person you are. Now, the first place we want to start when we want to change our identity is reflecting on who we are currently. Here's a quote. Quote, awareness and understanding of your abilities, character, and feelings is so important in making steps towards knowing what actions to take in creating the life you want. It's looking into your own soul and acknowledging what is there so that you can be intentional about who you mold yourself into. It's becoming aware of the thoughts, habits, beliefs, and actions that are working together every day to create your world so that you can be intentional about changing the things that you don't want to carry into your future. That quote literally just summarized the thing I just said about how who we are creates the world around us. So what does reflection look like? Well, reflect on your current life and your current characteristics, your current attributes. What are they like right now? What are some pros and cons about yourself? Are you someone that's impatient? Are you someone that's always beating yourself up? Are you someone that lacks empathy? Are you someone that is argumentative? What, it, what are some current things about yourself? And it doesn't just have to be negative things. There are some pros about you as well. There are some pros about you that you probably want to keep as you change to a different person. Maybe you're a great listener. Maybe you're somebody that opens up to other people. Maybe you're someone that looks after other people. So think about these characteristics. When you think about these characteristics, you need to be as honest as possible. As so honest that it hurts. <laughs> and the honesty has to be really like really honest because remember, you're analyzing yourself. So when you're whenever you're analyzing yourself, there is cases of there is potentials for self-deception. There is potentials for for not seeing your blind spots. So you have to be as objective as possible in your own analysis, especially if you're doing this yourself. Now, if you're working with someone on this, if um, you're working with a coach um, or you're working with somebody like me, you know, I can help you to be more honest, right? Because I tend to ask follow up questions, clarifying questions, things like that. But if you're doing it yourself, make sure that you're as honest as possible. Here's some questions you can keep in mind when you're doing self-reflection. How have I contributed to how my life is now? What are my patterns that are keeping me in the same place? Another way you can self-reflect is by taking personality. Another way you can self-reflect and you can do more self-discovery is by taking personality tests. I recommend the 16 personality test and the big five personality test uh, or the Hexaco personality test. All of these give really great insights into who you are. 
Um, it really helped me. Like when I took the 16 personality test, it said that I, I'm an INTP, a logician. And the results that it broke down really showcased how I am. And I, and I was like, wow, that's so accurate because I conjured up so many examples of how, okay, I am more assertive. Um, I am more of a thinking than feeling person, all, all things like that. A thing I do recommend for people when they take these tests is to maybe take multiple times in a short period, maybe twice, maybe twice or three times. Test results can be skewed based on how you felt in that particular day. So it's very important that you take it multiple times to make up for that possibility. Maybe one day you're more anxious. Maybe one day you're just tired and you want to go through the test fast, all sorts of situations. So it's important that you you know, take it two, three times in a short period to get more accurate results. And that way, if you do that and you see similar results at the end each time, or you get the exact same results each time, you know, you're very confident that this is a really good analysis of who you are. Now, for self-reflection, here's a, some additional questions you can ask. Uh, what have people said about you? So what's a common thing people say about you that you get a lot? It could tell you a lot about who you are. More people say something, uh, the more truth there may be behind it. You know, and it's not like these people all huddled up in a room and then said, hey, let's all say the same thing to uh, this guy or gal or whatever, <laughs> or whatever your name is, um, and just said it to you. No, it's like they have certain common experiences uh, when they interacted with you. Thus, it's important that you look into why they all came to that same conclusion. Another question you can ask is, what experiences have you found yourself in continually that keep reoccurring? Could tell you a lot about your behavior and the way you think. And also the, maybe the people you keep in your life, which is your decision. Uh, another one is looking into your traumas, what traumas you experienced uh, in the past, in childhood. And that bleeds into reflecting on your childhood, reflecting on who your caregivers were because, you know, they shape who you are. Your environment shapes who you are. So you want to look into that. You want to look into your culture. You want to look into your customs. You want to look into your societal trends. Uh, and reflect on that because those all contribute to who you are currently. Where'd you get your ideas from about how the world works? You know, what limiting beliefs were passed down onto you? Now, once you've done this, you want to reflect on what you want your life to look like. What are some exciting things you want for the future? Don't let your limiting beliefs tell you that this isn't possible because of this, because of this. As you list this out, you're going to get a feeling and the, these thoughts that come about of, oh, this that can't happen because of this, that can't happen because of that. Your, your conscious mind is going to come in and start making excuses. It's going to make reasons as to why this thing can't happen, especially if you have a lot of limiting beliefs. Ignore those and just get back to the paper and then write down the things that you want for what you want your life to look like. What are your values? Start there. If you understand your values, you'll start to understand what you want your life to look like because a successful life, an integrous life is a life built around someone's core values. What matters most? Is it family? Is it your independence? Is it financial freedom? What is it? List out your values and then list out what you want your life to look like. Uh, next, reflect on who you want to become. These are characteristics and attributes you want to have and you want to embody. Maybe you want to be more confident. You know, what does that even mean to you? Maybe you want to be more fearless. Maybe you want to be more decisive. What does that mean to you? It's important that you break down what this means so that you can later on, when we get to the habits part, you can know what habits you need to do. You can also look at the cons that you currently have about yourself. And if you want to work on those cons, you can look at the opposite trait for your ideal self. For example, if a con of yours is that you're stubborn, a, pr a, a trait of your ideal self is that you're open-minded. You're open-minded to ideas. So a habit that you would do is practicing being open-minded more in conversations with people, when you're coming across information on the internet, when you're um, sharing ideas with your friend, practicing being open-minded. That's an example. Next, you want to think about what's preventing you from changing and be as specific as possible and ask yourself why it's preventing you from doing so, right? Um, maybe you have limiting beliefs and fears. Where are those limiting beliefs and fears? Maybe you have negative habits that you keep doing. What are those negative habits? Maybe you lie to yourself a lot and you struggle with self-deception. And what are some examples of you lying to yourself? And what does this lying cover up about something you may not want to face about yourself? For more understanding about the inability to change when it comes to people, watch my video, Understanding People, Part 12. Next, establish your deep why. What is your deep why for changing? Your deep why is very personal. It's a deep, fundamental core 
drive behind you wanting to be a different person. It's not, it's not very surface level. There's a, there's a deep connection. It has a deep connection to, to who you are. Now, just because it has a deep connection to who you are does not mean that you have to put down a deep why of something you're supposed to say. Like, for example, someone that has a deep why of having financial abundance, they may think that that's shallow. So they may not put that as a deep why. They'll say something else. But truly to them, that is a deep why. And that's okay. So put that down. And you know it's a deep why by checking in with your body. Like, how do you feel when you say that? Like, does it hit home? Um, that's how you can use your emotions in a very powerful way to, you know, come to that conclusion of, okay, this is a very core fundamental deep why for you. Maybe your deep why is you want to take care of your family. Maybe you want to do philanthropy work and give back to the world. Maybe you want to be more healthy because your health is a priority for you. Maybe you want to have a strong life purpose. It's very important that you list out this deep why in detail. Here's a quote by me. Quote, deep whys can mature you more. Some deep whys remind you that it's not just about you. Your purpose for positive change impacts other people too. Think of the domino effect you have on society as you shift to a new identity using your deep why. That's huge. Um, the analogy of, of the domino effect is, is big here. Um, when it comes to like my, my deep why with content, it's that I want to make this type of information related to psychology, right, related to spirituality, very accessible for people and very applicable for people. And by doing so, they change themselves and improve themselves. And then this changes how they show up in their life. And it can have a positive effect on people in their life. They're spreading that positivity to other people. I'm trying to add a higher level of consciousness to the world. And by you working on yourself using my videos, you also add more consciousness to the world. And it creates a positive domino effect. So that's one of my deep whys. So the domino effect thing is just one example of coming up with your deep why. It can also help with you changing because you can also take an analysis of how you currently are and how you're adding maybe negativity to the world by behaving how you behave. So that's even powerful too. Now, by knowing what your current pros and cons are and knowing who you want to become and knowing what's getting in the way, what you can do is you can establish habits for the person you want to be. You can establish both, both positive habits that you need want to do and you can also establish habits that you need to stop doing because who you want to be, they don't do, they do certain things and they don't do other certain things that you may currently be doing. So it's very important. So you want to establish habits and make sure you find a way to keep yourself accountable. I recommend the habit share app. That's what we use in my program, but there's a lot of habit, you know, apps out there. You could even have a buddy system with a friend to really help you with navigating this, but you need to have an objective measure of your progress. If you don't have an objective measure, you could fall into self-deception. You could fall into just lying to yourself. So it's key that you have some sort of way to keep yourself accountable. When you say, I want to become this person. If you truly want to be that person, okay, let's have some objective metrics to make sure that you're, that you're becoming that person. Next, establish what you want to sacrifice. This kind of falls in line with what, with what you want to stop doing. What, what people do you want to remove from your life? What experiences do you want to sacrifice, right? Maybe you are currently in a stage of your life where you don't have a lot of time to hang out with friends too much. You don't have a lot of times to, you don't have a lot of time or money to travel or to do all this other stuff. You may have to sacrifice that for a time period so that you can focus on core things about yourself and about your life. Um, maybe you need to sacrifice certain spending habits at, for the moment because you need to save up for something in the future, right? Um, maybe you need to sacrifice what you consume media. Some people stay the same because they keep watching the same garbage. Some people stay the same because they keep, you know, consuming things that aren't in their best interest. And thus what they consume programs, their subconscious mind to stay the same or to just not be the person they want to be. Now, part two, I want to talk about programming yourself for change. This is when we get to the subconscious mind. In my video on the subconscious mind, I talked about the importance of habits. We don't just want that to be the only way we program ourselves to be different. We want to have affirmations in play that creates new belief systems in the subconscious mind. So what you, what's an important critical part of identity change, at least to kind of speed up the process a little bit, is affirmations. More so, more specifically, meditative affirmations. These are affirmations that you listen to over music, that your conscious mind doesn't really interpret so that it doesn't come in with its, 
you know, logical beliefs. With repetition, you start to ingrain these beliefs in the subconscious mind. And what do we, what do we know about the subconscious mind? Well, the subconscious mind dictates so many of our actions and because it dictates our belief system and our actions come from our belief system. So meditative affirmations is one. It's really simple. Put some meditation music together, list out affirmations. If you want to learn more about this, this process, watch my video on the subconscious mind, uh, or just join identity resonance. <laughs> Visualize. This is another way to program the subconscious mind. Visualize your ideal self. In my second channel, Gem Veda Meditations, I have a guided, I have a, you know, I have a free video on visualizing your ideal self and what they look like. And that, that way you can really make them very tangible. A lot of people look at life and they look at the physical world as the only tangible, like believable realm. And they completely neglect the mental realm, which is false. Because the law of correspondence tells us that our mental realm is another realm of causation. We can affect the world using our thoughts. So it's very key that we visualize who this person is. We visualize our ideal life. We visualize an ideal day. Because with this visualization, especially paired with the five senses, right, you create a lot of realism behind it. And you gain a lot of confidence, a lot of assumptions behind you achieving this said result. Achieving this identity. Another way to program your subconscious mind is with a vision board as well. Vision boards are boards that you where you put images of what you want onto them and you look at them every day and through that repetition, through that imagery, you start to create that said thing. Whether it's the actions you take or it's the circumstances that just magically happen. Now, how I do vision boards is a little bit different. I like to put the things I already have and put the things I want to have. By putting the things I already have, I, de I depersonalize the things I want by association. What do I mean by that? If I have an item I see every single day and I have it tangibly in my reality, and then I see my vision board, I see that item on there, but I also see the things I want, how do I start to view the things I want? Well, I don't put as much grandiosity to it. If, it's very, if that thing becomes very normal to me because it's associated with the things I already have, I depedestalize that thing I want, and then how I go towards it starts to change. I go towards it more with an assumptive nature behind. I go towards it with a, like, of course I have it. Of course it's here already. I almost celebrate before I achieve it. I'll give you a good example. My YouTube plaque might be a little dusty because I haven't picked it up in a while, but my YouTube plaque, like, I, I knew I would grow an audience this size. In fact, I know my audience is going to just keep growing. But I already celebrated before I got the plaque. Like, I, I, I was just, the excitement was already there. And then when I got the plaque, it's like, okay, the, the 3D world caught up to me. Like, it caught up. Good job, 3D world. It caught up to me. It caught up to what I want. That's how, that's, that's my mentality because I understand the power of the mental realm. And the vision board is a kind of a conduit to me um utilizing my mental realm to me also having that feeling of a, of that assumptive nature of okay it's going to happen now another thing especially if you're someone that tends to be anxious to to change if you tend to resist change you feel uncomfortable with changes some sort of you know bodily calming exercises this can be breath work this can be yoga so that you change your response to the stimulus of change because change may invoke certain things within you like anxiousness it's important to have practices that keep you grounded so that you can continue to do the work you need to do to become this new person because a lot of people like it's the fear that causes them to run back to comfort which is not what you want to do so i recommend yoga i recommend breath work i have a video on breath work and YouTube has a bunch of yoga videos. If you want me to do a yoga video, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put on my exercise clothes and <laughs> do some stretches for you guys. But, but it's very key. It's very key to have the body in line with what the mind wants. 
by calming it down so that the mind can operate. Next, use the law of assumption. Yes, use it. <laughs> it's powerful stuff. The law of assumption states that what we assume to happen will happen. We assume the end in mind. We go to the end result. We go to the finish line and we bring it to the forefront. We say, okay, I want to be like this. I want to be like this. I want to have this. Let's assume that I have it now. One of my favorite law of assumption techniques are called anchors. I call it anchors and I call it anti-anchors. Um, in my identity residence program, you know, when you, you know, if you work with me in there, we establish anchors for you. Anchors are items, decorations, clothes, anything physical that represents your ideal self that you get in the now. So you decorate your place in a certain way that would represent how your ideal self would decorate your place. Um, you wear certain clothes that your ideal self would wear. And by doing that, you create a feeling within yourself that you already, like you already assume that you're this person. Why? Because the material objects have created the feeling within you that you are this person. There are confirmation that you're this person. Like there are times where I'll get a nice watch because it confirms to me who I am. It's evidence of who I am. So the end in mind is brought to the present moment. Anti-anchors are the opposite. These are things you want to get rid of that don't fall in line with who you want to be. These can be items. These can be decorations. So toss them out. Get them out of your life. Because we don't, we don't want those items reinforcing our old self. There's literally clothes I throw away because it's like, well, I was a different person back then. Your vision board can also, be in a, can also contribute to the law of assumption. Because again, you're seeing it every day next to something you already have. So by seeing it, that association, you tend to assume that it's going to come about because you already because it's next to an item you already have. So it's like, of course, I have this thing as well. Next, the next part of identity change is forgiving your past, whether it's forgiving yourself or forgiving people uh, or situations that may have happened. Because you have to do this because you may be the reason why you you're, you're kind of stuck. Maybe because you're holding on to past hurt, past pain, maybe a past ex, maybe a friend, maybe something that was outside your control, and you're holding this grudge, you could be playing victim behind the grudge. Evidently, it's holding you back from changing. You have to forgive yourself, people, etc., both logically and emotionally, especially emotionally. I, I think visualization really helps with this. One visualization technique I can recommend is you visualize your current self having a conversation with your old self, telling that old self that they are forgiven, that it is okay that this happened. Maybe hugging your old self. But whatever is needed so that in the mental, mental realm, you're having that dialogue of forgiveness of it's okay. Maybe your visualization has to be with you when you were a child. Yeah, maybe you have to do some inner child healing. And maybe forgive yourself for mistakes you made when you were very young that you maybe still blame yourself for. So forgiveness is very, very important when it comes to us letting go of the shackles that keep us stuck, letting go of the, of the grief, letting go of the guilt, letting go of the shame. Um, whether you need to forgive a parent, whether you need to forgive yourself, a friend, whatever, make sure you do it. And forgiveness doesn't always require a dialogue with the person. That's the important thing to remember. You don't have to have a dialogue with the person. It, is, it also doesn't even mean that you forget what they did. It just means that you no longer hold on to that hurt. Here's a quote. Working on forgiveness can lessen that axe grip on you. It can help free you from the control of the person who harmed you. Sometimes forgiveness might even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion for the one who hurt you. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you. It also doesn't necessarily mean making up with the person who caused the harm. Forgiveness brings a kind of peace that allows you to focus on yourself and helps you go on with life. Very well said. That's a really good quote on forgiveness. Next, develop the habit of reframing. Reframing is your ability to view the silver lining in negative situations so that you can change your lens. Because a lot of times we have negative interpretations of what happens, of, of negative circumstances and situations. I have a reframing sphere here that really models and summarizes this phenomenon of reframing. In the center of the sphere, you see positive interpretations. In the top and bottom, in most of the sphere, you see negative interpretations. This represents our negativity bias as humans. By stopping, pausing, and thinking of what's the lesson in this, what's the long-term um, what is the long-term 
benefit of this negative situation, you can now can reframe it to see the positive. And with a positive interpretation, you now change your relationship to that negative situation. And what I also recommend is you add this to your habits, the habit of reframing. Here's a quote by Marcus Aurelius. Quote, if you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but it is your estimate of it. And this, you have the power to revoke at any moment. I love that quote. You can definitely, uh, that, that quote definitely corresponds with reframing because we have the power to change our relationship to whatever we're faced with by changing the way we think about it. Next, integrate your shadow traits, trace the new you has, right? Especially those traits. Traits that you have pushed down for whatever reason because you deem them un unnatural, unworthy. You were, you know, there was social conditioning around those given traits. Maybe your ideal self has those traits. Uh, one thing I love using when it comes to shadow work is Carl Jung's 12 archetypes. Uh, this, that, that circle with the 12 archetypes. I'll leave a link below to a really good website um, explaining those 12 archetypes. Learning about each of those archetypes, you can start to pick up traits that you can, you can integrate into your psyche, into how you behave, so that you can truly become that new person. You can also use this to help identify the affirmations needed to program your subconscious mind to be this new person. So there's the outlaw archetype, there's the jester, there's the, there's the king archetype. There's the magician. There's a sage archetype. I could go through all these archetypes. It would make the video longer though. So I highly recommend you check out that website. If you are enrolled in the subconscious secrets, there's a video where I go over the 12 archetypes uh, in great detail. Next, keep normalizing your new reality and keep deep pedestalizing the things you want. So normalizing your new reality means seeing all the evidence that you are changing. If you're someone that's working on your ability to talk to the opposite sex, you're seeing that you're more confident around the opposite sex. You see that you're asking, you know, people out more. You see that you're going on great dates. You're seeing that people are enjoying your company. So this is evidence that you're becoming somebody different and that propels you forward in your identity change. Another thing is you keep depersonalizing things. So you keep looking at your you keep looking at your vision board. You keep normalizing your new life and your new self. It's no longer this, oh my God, uh, I'm this person now. It's like, of course I'm this person, right? Like, of course I'm a rock star. Of course I'm a YouTuber. Of course I'm a dentist, <laughs> you know? Of course I'm this, per like whatever it is, deep it. Because whatever we pedestalize, it makes it harder for us to go towards that thing. There's more anxiousness around it. There's more fears. There's more all of this stuff depersonalize it, normalize it, because when you have something consistently, you always it's always normal. So you might as well make it normal before you even get it. Next, in times of setbacks, keep reframing. So there'll be times where you're, you know, inconsistent with habits. You're um there's setbacks in your life. There's things slowing you down. That's fine. What's the silver lining? What's the positive interpretation you can come out with? And reframing is not delusion. It's a true lens that that you can look at. Some people try to argue and say, oh, that, you know, that, that could be delusion. It's because they're so used to having negative interpretations that reframing is that foreign to them that it seems like delusion. And in a sense, we are kind of delusional anyways. Even people that have negative interpretations, they're literally delusional towards the negative side. I talked about this before in, my, in, in one of my videos. And next, next, reflect on the change and reflect on being a new person. Reflect on how much you've changed. Go, maybe go back to earlier notes about yourself and make note of key differences you've seen in yourself. Maybe retake your, your personality test and see how different your results are in, in your personality. Take it two, three times in a row at the end here, just like you did in the beginning. This can tell you a lot about yourself. Also, pay attention to what people say about you. What, what, are, what are some things people are saying? Like, oh, you're really different now. Oh, I noticed you're like this now. This is, this is, again, added evidence of you becoming a different person. If you need help with this, I have an entire program called Identity Resonance dedicated to identity change and identity shifting. If you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, click the link below to fill out the form, and I'll reach out to you if I think I can help you. In this video, I did make mention of the subconscious mind. I have an entire video that goes deep into 
how the subconscious works, definitely check it out right here.